That's true. Phil, let's talk uh, about your life in handball. What uh, what drew you to handball in the first place? Well, uh, Ben I was a basketball player. Actually, it's better not, not to use my name. Okay. I was a basketball player. And uh, we did not have a gymnasium where I went to grammar school, St. Vitus. So that my priest, Father Burke, says, Phil, you better go to the YMCA because they have a beautiful gym and you're able to work out. While I'm playing basketball in our Irving Park Y in Chicago, in the locker room, you can oversee in, in the court from the balcony from the locker room. I watched a game of handball played for a year and a half before I even walked in the court. Reason being, I didn't want to ruin the guys their game because I was a duffer. So one day, a, a fellow by the name of C.P. Clark, who's still alive, 93 years old, said, son, would you like to play some handball? I said, I'd love to, but I don't want to ruin your game. He said, well, go on the back of the court, where they, you can't see in the back, there's no windows. And I said, fine. So that was really how I got started in my first session. After that, I got a little confidence in being a basketball player. I was able to move well, anticipate good reactions, but I, I really hurt my father. My father was a professional baseball player for G. Phil Collins. He was with the Phillies uh, from 23 and all the way to 35. And you know how a father is, he, he wants to be a follow his footsteps. So I said to my dad one day, I said, you know, dad, I said, uh, I'd love to play baseball. I play baseball. I don't want to embarrass you. I'm a pitcher. And I sort of got a sore neck from watching that ball go over the fence. He said, son, he said, we can help. I'll help you improve your game. I said, dad, you know, I, I started playing this game called handball. I said, I really like it. Well, my dad, my dad died the next year, and uh, I was able to start playing handball on a basis where I, would, I started out playing singles and doubles, and uh, I was always a, a team man, and doubles was always my sport. I, I wanted to be a team man. I played good singles, but I played sharper handball and doubles. I, I feel that handball helped me in my career so much. The little black ball, when we played all these tours around the country, we, Johnny Sloan, Jimmy Jacobs, and myself, we traveled from 1955 to 1958, thousands of miles, one-nighters, not getting big money, but from the heart to spread the word and the gospel of the United States handball system. And I feel today that if we don't get back to the old way of marketing the game, we're gonna lose out. I feel that this is a very, it's a necessity. And we have us old timers, Herskowitz, Jacobs, Sloan, myself, we put all this time into the game, and we do not want to go it down, downhill. And we, we, we're working hard at it. The four of you all live in Florida together, right? No, uh, the only one that lives in Florida with me is Vic Hurst oh, oh, in Davie, Florida. John lives in Houston, Texas, and uh, of course I live in Montana. Kenny Schneider, I mean, Kenny Conker lives in Des Moines, Steve Subic lives in Omaha, I mean, uh, Minneapolis. Yes. But the thing, when I started this National Handball Hall of Fame Club in February of 92, we wanted to keep the fellowship of all the years of, of our being together. Uh, Vic, Johnny, and I were taping some of our history at my home, and after I made home my chili, we had a few beers, and I said to Jan and Vic, I said, uh, would you be interested in starting a reunion every year or a handball club? And Vic says, sure, why not? 
uh, we have many memorable stories to talk about. Uh, we, it's hard to find all these people because of our age. And the biggest thing was to assemble uh, and to get locations to find these old timers. And that's been my hardest thing. And through CIA work and coming to tournaments now, uh, wearing my badge, they all don't know me, but uh, the generation has changed. And, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're gaining that. We started with 20 members now in uh, 92. We got close to 125. We have sponsors. We have uh, a newsletter that makes sense. It's about us, about people all over the country. I need some sound bites now, so I'm going to ask you some questions where I want you to give me uh, shorter answers okay. so that we can squeeze them in there. What did, I don't know if there is a way to give me a short answer on this, but what did the firehouses have in common with Hamble? Why was uh, Hamble seen in so many firehouses? Well, one reason it was because we had a fire commissioner that was very interested in handball. Number two was he wanted to keep his men in shape. He wanted to work them out and be physically fit because firefighting is tough. And uh, whatever money they earn in the fire department, it, it's earned. And this is uh, Bob Quinn, who was a fire commissioner and died since, was a handball man from way back. Played with Joe Craddock. I was introduced to Major League Handball with Joe Platt and Lieutenant Bob Quinn. And uh, when I, I thought I was pretty good in handball, we won a doubles YMCA championship. So my manager, we had a manager who would book matches. He said, you need different competition. He said, I got two guys I'd like for you to play. We played these two fellows not knowing who they were. We get in the court, we were, we were the A doubles champs, we got 21-1. Second game, we got 21-3. In five games, we don't get a total of 21 points. So we get out of the court, we go in the locker, and you see everybody coming around these two fellows. And I said to my manager, I said, who's this girl and who's this guy? He said, well, the fall on the left was the great Joe Paddock. I said, why didn't you tell me? And well, I scared him. He said, you're young. And he said, the other guy was uh, Bob Quinn. He's a lieutenant on the fire department. Well, that was my real major league starting handball. And uh, then, of course, uh, the years went on. I, uh, 1947, 48, 1958, one day a guy shows up at the Y and Looked like he's from California. And he's you know, silk shirt, fancy shoes. He comes in and uh, he comes to the locker room and he says, Are there any handball players around? And the locker room attendant says, Yeah, there's a guy by name Phil Collins. He said, Could I play him? He said, and the locker room attendant says, Fine. So we get in the court, hit the ball. He introduces himself. He said, What's your name? I said, Phil Collins. What's your name? He said, My name is Jim Jacobs. He says, uh, I come from the West Coast here and I uh, want to get some experience in handball. I heard there's a lot of handball players here. So I played Jimmy for 30, maybe a month and a half. And in the meantime, he goes to see Bob Kenner from Community Builders, the, the town club. And he says, uh, uh, he said, I, there's, a, there's a club in Chicago called the town club. He said, that's where all the national tournaments are held, the glass on the sidewall, the first glass court. He said, uh, I think that we better go down and play there. I said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for it. He said, yeah, come on down. So we went down with, we, uh, on a Wednesday, and when we first started playing handball, singles, there were maybe 10 people in the gallery. Now the word got around that the two rookies are playing handball and now the gallery starts f filling up. I like Gus Lewis, Kenny Schneider. Uh, at that time they had Jack Gordon and everybody starts filling up. Now we're in the third game, it's the third man, the third set. The 
but she gave a piece, and now we're, we're really going good. It's uh, up 11, 12, 15, 18, hot. So we get through, he beats me 21, 19, go down to the locker room, Bob Kendler is waiting there and he says, uh, say, he says, I hear you play Irving Park. Uh, would you like to have dinner with us tonight? I said, fine, Bob. Mr. Kemmler at that time, because I was pretty young, went to dinner and he said, uh, so I like what I saw in the clip. He said, uh, Jimmy said, has spoken highly about you. Would you be interested in representing the Chicago Town Club? And I said, well, that sounds pretty good. So I, I became a, a member of 16 of the finest and Hong Kong players in the world. We had Frank Coyle, Billy Bear, Gene Valgarino, we had Vic Riskwitz, Rick Gordon, Leo Dressler, 18 in one stable. Now if you cannot learn with that kind of talent, you're, you should give up the game. Um, you know, we had a stable of ball players, but we even had Al Banyue, who was one of the finest and the three-time national championship player, singles. Uh, poor Al uh, decided that after he won his third title, he wanted to be a boxer. Well, uh, he, he got in the ring and he got clobbered and killed and lost, and then he got barred from handball for the rest of his life. But he was a tremendous individual. After we got to meet and we used to travel, we'd go to San Francisco, LA, we always stopped to see Al because he, Johnny, myself, and a fellow by the name of Frank Clark, we were a great team because we had the right stories, human interest stories, and a lot of fun. And that was what handball was. We, we met and we were competitors, but we ended up friends. Is Frank Coyle Lefty Coyle? Frank Lefty Coyle. Okay. Someone told me a story about the fact that the line after the short line, it, it, it's kind of a dotted line now, right. is called the Lefty Coil line. Well, Lefty Coil, my first national tournament, I played with Sam Haver in doubles, and uh, Billy Bear and Frank Coil were the doubles team of our club. And, our, and uh, in my first nationals in 1951, uh, we played Lefty and Billy, and the first game we, we lost 21-17, but Lefty uh, was such a tremendous ball player. He had all the moves. He was an excellent water polo player, and, but uh, in fact, Lefty beat Joe Playdick in 1944, and Joe, of course, being a great champion as he was, uh, Lefty was the type of guy that if you couldn't learn from him and how to play winning handball, again, you're, you shouldn't be playing handball. Lefty had uh, control of the left court where you were talking about that second lefty call line. He would suck a player in and then he would pass him with a fist down the left. Lefty would bring him, take him back, and Lefty would use a soft shot with his left hand sidewall front wall. And if you got to know that too much, he would suck you again with the same stroke. Lefty would bring it to center of court down the right. So he had about 8, 10, 12 shots in the same position. But what he had that was so great he was a thinker. He was a master. He was uh, like a chess and chess player. He could change the pace of the ball. And that's what they miss today in, in the young handball players. It's like a pitcher with a change of pace. You can't throw the fast one all the time. And uh, we all learned. Vic, I learned a lot from Vic. And he, there was a master of two hands, right and left. And uh, he was able to hook the ball. Jimmy Jacobs, great, great bag. 
up there in Finkern. Two good hands. Johnny Sloan, my partner, the court general. I mean, this guy, uh, they never gave him enough credit for his ability because he wasn't a flashy player. He was a thinker, he was a mover, a shaker, but he had guts. We played the monster team in 1957 in Dallas. That was the number one and two singles player, Jacobs and Herskowitz. Johnny and I were coming up in 57. We started in 55 playing together, but by 57, we were there because we played so much handball. Our timing was so fantastic. We could, we could hit a ball, blindfold, behind our back, chop shots, hooks, great serves. And like uh, Vic and I, when we do our travel, we talk about how much is a serve worth? He said, so, like your serve, 60% of what a serve is worth. Then control, and being able to take the player out of the front court with a ceiling, pass shot, and Vic had all that, with both hands, natural. I mean, you could not tell the difference. Bob Brady, we played him. Bob was a tremendous player, but he didn't have the left. But he had the tremendous right, and he had this Johnny Sloan, guts, shots. Team player, that's what doubles in. And, uh, you know, I can go down the line, Gus Lewis, Kenny Schneider. Got it though, don't you think? Yeah, we still you were going to say something about what Bandway used to say to you. He said, say something like, Kid, you want to know how to do something. Okay, yeah, I can bring that in. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. You know, one thing I learned from well, one of the all time greats, Hall of Famers, Al Bandway. He said, You know, the kid, he says, uh, you, got all the, you got all the moves, you got all the shots. He said, Well, why don't you try some of the shots I'm talking about with the fifth? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm an open shot player. Hand, wrist, action, snap of the wrist, cup of the hand. I said, I couldn't pattern my game after yours because I'm, I'd be a dub. He said, but listen, he says, yeah. you know, uh, so he said, he got in the court with me one day and he said, you know, I used to climb, fly up into the walls and make some tremendous good. I said, well, that's your step. My style, serve, kill, volley, pass, not much on the ceiling, only as a defensive shot. Because I came from a small court, Irving Park Lancer, which was a band box. 36 long, 18 feet wide, with a 12 foot ceiling. Your reactions had to be fast and fantastic. Then we went. One year, 56, from Irving Park, we went to the New York AC, which was 48 by 30, with a chicken wire ceiling. I thought I was in the grand ballroom of the walled office story. Son said, what are we doing here? I said, I guess we're supposed to win. <laughs> so that was, one, that was our first big break and first big victory. We beat the AAU the great defending champions of John Abbott and Joan Grasso. They were the favorite. They won three in a row. And then Jimmy and Vic were in the finals of the singles, and I lost to Vic in the semis, and, and John lost to Jimmy. But in that particular case, the AAU, at the beginning of the week, they said, now, you're playing both singles and doubles. We will give you the opportunity to pick the event that you would like to play. Say you're both in the singles and doubles, we'll let you, if you want to play the doubles first, fine, if you like to play the singles. But the midway in the week, Charlie O'Connell says, we got to renegotiate what we talked about. Because they could see that we would be going to play the defending champions. Now there's no more choice. By this time, I'm boiling. I'm like a caged lion. And I said to my partner, Sloan, you're going to be playing in the finals. I said, 
you play the finals, I'll take care of the bugs. And uh, Jan lost to Jimmy. And then we went in, and they didn't. Jan said, I don't need a break. Let's go in and play. I said, Jan, just rest. I had one of my hottest days I ever had. And between the, the match, the warm up, it lasted, it lasted less than 28 minutes. We beat him 21 to 3, 21 to 4. With the closing of a serve on the last 21st point, I threw a reverse and I hit Joe and Gracia in the stomach. And I, when I got out of the court, I said to Charlie O'Connor, I said, Charlie, that was your doing. If you didn't get me so hot, it would have maybe been a better match. But all those poor people in the gallery got cheated. Vic, when did you first start playing handball? I started playing handball in the school when I was a kid. With a tennis ball, just hit the ball around. When was that? Uh, in the, around uh, 1932, 33, I guess. And I didn't make a high school team, even though we had high school handball in New York City, PSAL, and uh, Red Albach was on the team that I didn't make. But uh, I began to play at the beach after I graduated school. I went down to Coney Island and played at the beach. I won a novice tournament. And then I played in the in 1940. I ended up in the finals of the One World Nationals and lost. A fellow named Mort Alexander. And then I played single wall until around 19, well, during the war I didn't play. 46 or 40, no, 47 I think I started to play four wall. And Trinity Club director made me join the Brooklyn Central YMCA to start playing a little four wall. And Trulio was the national handball champion in 46. And I played him in the state tournament in 47 and knocked him out of the tournament. That was my beginning. When I did that, Bob Kendler heard about me and invited me to Chicago 48 to play in the tournament. That's Talk about Bob Kendler. Yeah, Bob Kendler was... Uh, I, th I don't think we'd have handball today if it wasn't for Bob Kendler. Because he just put more life into the game. The AAU didn't care one way or the other. All they were interested in what revenue they can get out of a sport. And Kendler uh, rejuvenated handball. It was great for handball. Did you have any personal contact with him, personal relationship? Yeah, I went out to see if I could work for him. And I stayed there about five weeks and then came back home. Why was that? I didn't think I could do the kind of work he wanted me to do, which was selling, remodeling. And at that time, there was a little recession going on, and it was a question of putting people in behind an eight ball with mortgages, trying to sell them refinancing and all. And I just, it wasn't my cup of tea. So I went back to New York and became a firefighter, worked as a fireman. What was that like, working as a fireman in New York? It was a difficult job, things that went on in New York City. New York was unique, the building was unique, they had stories, they had buildings that had three sub-cellars and high-rise buildings, difficult fires. Did you, uh, you, you played in the uh, policeman, fireman, handball? No, I didn't get to play against them. They, I was on the fire department list when several of the chiefs of the fire department knew I was on the list to become a firefighter, so they called me in and interviewed me and I told them that I was on the list, but I still had to go through a medical exam and training program, and they said, well, we'll take care of that problem. Just get yourself all set. So I got in the fire department, and I was in training at the school at the fire academy, and I got a leave of absence to go play in a national tournament, which is very odd for them to allow that. Were, were there any other great firemen, handball uh, players? Well, like I said, Bill Laura was one of them. But they had uh, 
One of the other one war players that was a good fire fighter was a fellow named Frank Russo. He was the father of Patty McCormick that played in the Bad Seed, the actress. And he was a pretty good player. He had quite a number of athletes in the fire department, all types of sports. One of the fellows I worked with was on the New York Athletic Club uh, water polo team, playing in all the colleges and all these uh, championships throughout the country. But, uh, it's just one of the games that you just, uh, it gets to you and it becomes a disease. What, uh, what did you, uh, of all the years that you played handball, what was the most, the accomplishment you're most proud of? The one year I won the one wall, three wall, and a four wall, well, one year. That was the biggest accomplishment. That was 1949. Was there something about that, uh, the way you were playing at that time? Well, I was playing good, good competitive ball and good control game and I had a, an offensive <coughs> game. My game was not a defensive game, but offensive. And I had two good hands. I swung, I swung naturally with my weak hand, which was my left, but I did well with it. I made all kinds of shots with it, services, hooks, so all around game. You, um, you played with uh, some of the great players back uh, in the 40s and 50s. Yes. Who were the guys that most impressed you? Well, the most impressive one that I thought that gave me the most trouble was a fellow named Walter Pleakin from Buffalo. He just had a kind of a game, control game, where uh, wherever, you, wherever you hit the ball you got it, he put it another foot or two further away from you all the time. But that was just with me. Other players had an easier time with him than I did. Jimmy Jacobs was probably the toughest one I played, but there was a difference of 12 and a half years. So it's hard to equate them because of the time element involved. What was the toughest thing for you, switching from one wall to four wall, to have to learn? I learned the back wall. The back wall. My offensive game was taking balls out of the air on a fly. I didn't let anything go to the back wall unless it had, you know, I had no choice. But to develop the back wall, you had to put in enough time. And I didn't practice as much as I should have, probably, to make that a good offensive shot for me. <coughs> so had you practiced as much as you should have? How many? No, I played one wall throughout the summer, and I played four wall for three or four months throughout the winter. Where would you play your four wall? At the Brooklyn Central YMCA in Brooklyn, over on Hanson Place. Then I became a member of the New York Athletic Club, but that was many years afterwards. <coughs> but my one wall was basically at Brighton Beach, Manhattan Beach, Oriental Beach. And uh, I think all the boys that played at the beaches were the best one wall players in New York City. Because they played almost all year long. Do you still play today? Yes, I do. Where do you play? I had two artificial knees and a hip and back surgery, and I still play. I play down in uh, at the uh, Florida, South Florida Racquet Club in, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Well, it's not Fort Lauderdale, it's part of Hollywood, right on the fringes. But we play whenever I get a chance to play, I love to play. If I don't hurt, I get in there and play. But the only hurt I have today is lack of playing. You know, you have to play often enough to get your muscle tone back so you can not hurt. But the artificial joints are no problem at all. Great. What, uh, what do you think of today's modern players? Well, they're improving the same as every other sport improves. It's just a question of the competition. Is the competition equal to the top player to give him enough of a game? And in the time that we played, we had five or six players that on a given day, either one of them could win a national tournament, according to a draw. Uh, Nady Alvarado won 11 times, but I don't know if his competition was as strong to be able to win that way. So it uh, depends on the people that are in the, in the game at the time. What do you think of David Chapman? Well, I never saw David play except on the Gatorade tournament. 
that they showed on ESPN. And uh, like I say, uh, I'd have to watch him more to know whether he's the best around today, probably. I think that Bike should be able to vary his game more to be able to give him competition. Well, I think John Bike does is hit hard and straight shots down the wall instead of playing the wall. And it's, a, it's a mental game, too. Can you go into that more, Vic? What about the mental part of the game? Well, the mental part of the game is the same as any other sport. You have to outthink your opponent. And you have to maneuver them around the court in order to make the shot that you want to be good. Whether it's a kill shot or a passing shot, it depends on your, your positioning of the court when you hit the ball around. What, what would you do to maneuver your opponent? Well, I would play fall as if I were in a chess court. I'd be having my opponent either in the front right corner or deep left corner. I'd have him in different positions. And if I didn't have the shot, I drove a ball hard enough to make my next shot. But like I said, the hops on a ball also was an asset, which meant a lot. See, from playing one wall, which is strictly an offensive game, and I develop a good service, a good fly ball kill shot, a driving shot, and the hops play an important part because in one wall you learn to read a hop. I don't think the four wall players learn to read the hops as well as the one wall players did. How would you put a hop on a ball? Well, natural or reverse, wherever you want to put it. But talk about that, the actual physical. Yeah. You mean the way to hit them? Yeah. Well, the ball has to come off on this part of your hand to throw a natural on the inside of your hand, and the reverse has to come off on the reverse side of your hand. Whether you carry your wrist over or you slide the ball over, depending on the break of the hop that you want to get. You can make a hop go different speeds and different breaks. How important was the serve to you? To me, it was 60% of the game. My, my, my way of playing, the, the service was as good as getting a weak return or making an ace. See, today, they play to get a return ball in volley and see who wears each other down. Plus, today, they play 11-point tiebreakers. We used to play two out of three 21-point games. Before I started to play, they used to play three out of five in competition. So to me, I think they're making the game a little easier, even though it's fast. The ball is a little faster. But uh, conditioning was a very important part of the game, too. There were some players that are good for like one or two games. The third game, they didn't have it left. So everything hinged on your training, your conditioning, your mental outlook. To me, when the guy could be my best friend, when he got in the court, he was my enemy. Either he beat me or I had to beat him. That's what I try to do. You see, a one-wall game is a control game because of the boundary lines. And if you didn't have control, you weren't a good player. So my game was I had power in both hands, but I couldn't control the ball. I would be hitting him out most of the time. But to develop my game, I took some power off just to gain control, and then the power returned gradually on its own with the same strokes that you have. But I got the control of the court the way I wanted it. And that became my game. I had a good, strong service, placed the ball wherever I would want. At one time, I felt that I could put a coin on it court hit the coin with the control I developed. What made you, uh, what, what was the technique that you used to develop such control, such pinpoint accuracy? Well, just, I wasn't a mathematician, but when the swing, either you took a full swing or a shortened swing, that you hit an angle or you hit the ball in a position where you knew you were going to put it, and that developed the control. How important was it for you to keep your eye on the ball Always. at the moment never, that you hit it? Never take your eye off the ball at any time, at any time, whether it's one wall or four wall. You must always keep your eye on that ball. Then as your body moves around with the ball, you just develop a stroke or a certain height where you swing at. Of 
course, he can change his own overhand or sidearm or underhand stroke. But you always keep your eye on the ball. I see a lot of good players, some of the pros sometimes. It seems like they're swinging with their eye off the ball, look, the eye looking at the spot on the wall where they want the ball to go. That could be. Maybe that's how they play today. I know I had good peripheral vision that if I saw my opponent or I didn't, I knew where to hit the ball. Depended on where I saw my opponent. If I didn't see him, I knew I could put the ball low inside. And if he was anywhere in my vision, I'd put it around him. So you play for your next shot. You can't have a pattern game. I never played a pattern game. Some players play a pattern game. They hit a ball to the left or they hit it to the right or they play a scotch toss. I never knew myself what I was going to do until I got that ball where I wanted to hit it. And I saw my opponent where I didn't see him. They're planning to tear down Brighton Beach Bad. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's a shame that they're doing that with all the clubs. Because that was the mecca of, well, they did it with Manhattan Beach and Oriental Beach during the war. They closed it down and made a, sea, a uh, Coast Guard base out of it. We used to play exhibition at night at Manhattan Beach when I started. Same with Brighton. At Brighton Beach, we had a, an amphitheater that you'd see 2,000 people. And we used to have the place packed all the time. Every Saturday and Sunday, we used to run sweepstakes or tournaments. Always full house. Standing room only. Johnny, uh, what uh, what brought you to handball? Well, in high school, I was a uh, wrestler in high school. I won the high school city championship in Chicago. And I used to go over to Irving Park Y and uh, chase the ball in the court by myself, just keep it in play with a sweatsuit to cut weight for wrestling. And some of the old timers around Irving Park Y adapted me and got me playing with them. And, uh, so they took on the handball. In fact, it was funny, they had a novice tournament at the Illinois Athletic Club, and I entered it, and that was when they had just started the AHU. And uh, after playing in that, I went into a central AAU wrestling meet, and I couldn't participate. They said I was ineligible because I had competed in a non-sanctioned tournament. So, of course, Bob Gendler was going to start a lawsuit uh, against the AAU and everything. I said, well, Bob, I'm through school and I'm not going to be wrestling anymore, but I like handball. I'm going to play handball. So he gave me a membership at the town club. I used to hang around there. At the time, Bob had all the national champions working for him, you know, to get him away from the AAU. I used to hang around in case one of them wouldn't show up so I could get in a game. I had probably about 20 of the best teachers in the world all there at the town club when I was starting out. So a lot of it had to rub off. When did you sense that you were becoming a better than average player? Well, I think I developed real fast. I had been playing a couple of years and uh, uh, Jack Gordon came to Irving Park Y. He got sort of out of the outs with Bob Keller and he adapted me and we won a national wide doubles tournament when I was 18 years old. And, uh, in fact, I'm one of the few players I was over the hill by the time I was 27. I had played so much handball, it was like a full-time thing. But I guess the time I was 27, I got married and had a baby. I was, I was the end of my good handball. Talk about Jimmy Jacobs. The two of you went on a tour at one time, did you? Yeah, well, we went on a tour. It started out to be 40 cities and uh, ended up, we put on 15,000 miles on my car and hit 70 some cities uh, up and down from coast to coast. Uh, started out, like I say, in Chicago and Milwaukee. That's where we played the two matches in one day. Minneapolis, Butte, Montana, Pacific Northwest, Vegas. Then down through Florida and southeast up the coast there. And Mort Levy was putting together the tournament from Chicago, so we didn't get a lot of notice sometimes. So there were times when we'd have to drive straight through all night just to make the next stop. But uh, we had a lot of fun. That was a story here where you had to play twice in one day. Okay, well that was at the start of this tour. 
And of course, when this tour started, you know, Jimmy was the national champion, and I had uh, never beaten him in singles. And uh, when we got to Milwaukee, they said, well, we want you to play at the Jewish Community Center in the afternoon and at the YMCA in the evening. So Jimmy said, John, this is going to be a long tour. We have to conserve our energy. He says, we'll play at three-quarter speed. I'll win at the JCC, and you win at the YMCA. That way we'll conserve our energy. We play at the JCC in the afternoon. Jimmy won 21-12, 21-12. That night we played at the YMCA. Jimmy won 21-12, 21-12. After the match, I, what happened with this arrangement? I said, well, John, how badly did you want me to play? <laughs> we didn't talk for 200 miles to Green Bay. We went on the court there, and it was just like Irving Park with a low ceiling, like my home court. And that was the worst beating he got on the whole tour. Then he said, well, now will you talk to me when we're in the car? So see, I don't know if he dumped the game or not. What about uh, Bob Kimber? You, did, did you know Mr. Kimber well? Bob was like a second father. I, mean, uh, say I met him when I was in high school. Uh, he did so much for him and for me. He was best man at my wedding when, when uh, I got married. And he. Uh, he did so much for handball when handball wasn't making any money, you know, and I used to see the money coming out of community builders to support the game. What do you think his biggest accomplish was, accomplishment was in handball? Bob Kendler, you mean as a player? No, as a, uh, as a savior for the sport. Oh, well, I think when the AAU was running handball back in the 40s, uh, there was no publicity. They were doing nothing for the game. They just wanted to have a championship, have an AAU handball championship. They didn't care if it was a, a New York AC club tournament or what. And uh, when Bob started the, the uh, AHU, which became the USHA, uh, the AAU threatened to ban all the participants. And uh, Bob started a lawsuit against the AAU. And of course, then they called him and they said, what is the problem? And Bob said, well, we want that a letter from you stating that you won't bar these players anymore. And I think part of the agreement was they changed it from AHU, which sounded too much like AAU, they changed it to the USHA. And since then, it got promoted. All the courts are standardized now, 20 by 40. They have glass exhibition courts. They used to play in the basements of YMCA's and uh, build the court to fit the building. You know. Okay. Um, did you know Walter Clayton? Yeah, I, knew, I never played competitively against Walter. He was uh, through really playing serious tournaments when I was uh, winning my first tournaments. But I saw Walter play doubles in Chicago in 54, and he played doubles with Gus Lewis. And I remember seeing him hit Harry Dreyfus in the stomach with the ball three times in a row with his hops, and Harry was the national champion. Uh, he was something else. He just got voted into the Hall of Fame last year, which was long overdue. Great. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to cover. Um, you started playing in Chicago, right? Started playing in Chicago. Everything right. Did you play any three wall? Yes. In fact, I won a national three wall championship with Bob Brady. We beat the Oberts in the finals. They were leading 20 to 10. And we ended up winning at 21-20 the third game. Then, of course, I played with Marty Decatur in 1962. And I think that was the easiest tournament I went through. We played the Oberts in the finals. And I, I don't think I had to hit 20 balls. Marty played the two of them by himself and kept them in single figures. Talk about Marty Decatur. What was he like? Marty was a kind of doubles player where 
he could fit in with anyone. You know, if, if you wanted him to take over the whole game, he could do that. If you wanted him to play 10%, he could do that. I think that's why he and Jimmy played so well together. You know, Jimmy wasn't an easy player to play with, probably uh, because he was so good. You know, he, but I could see them playing, and when Jimmy wanted to play, Marty stayed out of the way. But when Jimmy was getting a little tired or something, Marty could also take over the game and, uh, you know, be the captain. What about Bob Brady? Bob was just one of the fiercest competitors I ever saw. He, when he went in the court, he hated it. And, you know, afterwards, he might become a little friendly, but he just went in there and it was all business. If you were between him and the ball, you better beware of getting knocked down flat because he, he didn't care who you were or what you were. He would, he would go 110%. Now, he was a San Franciscan, you were in Chicago. How did the two of you hook up to play doubles together? Well, I was in the Army and I went to a, a three wall tournament and I lost to Vic in the singles and Brady lost to Jimmy, I believe, in the singles. And we still had time to get in the doubles. You know, they started the doubles after the singles. Huh? And uh, Bob said, uh, I had, I had played Bob in 59 in the finals of the singles championship and beat him. And he said, do you want to play doubles? And I said, sure, I'd love to. And that was the first time we'd ever played together and we ended up winning it. And then finally, I want to ask you about Vic. Talk about uh, Vic's game. Well, Vic had a game all of his own. He, uh, he could do probably more things with the ball than, than anyone I've ever seen. Both hands, left hand. I mean, he did things like throw reverse hops down the right wall with his left hand and things like that. So, in order to stay in the game with Vic, that's how I had to develop a ceiling game because that was the only place you could hit the ball where he wasn't fly killing it or driving it down your throat. And Jimmy did very much the same thing. And we're both sort of thankful he was 40-ish when we were playing him. He was quite a person. You know, I don't want to get into who was the greatest here or there, but I know he would have had a pretty good seat.